Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us for today's session on blended finance evaluation. My name is Megan Kennedy Schwan, and I am the head of evaluation and the development cooperation directorate at the OECD. It's my pleasure to be joining you from Paris today and to have three fantastic panelists who will be sharing some insights. If we can go ahead and show the next slide with key session takeaways, please. In today's discussion, we will be sharing some initial thinking from our working group on evaluating blended finance. This is a working group of the OECD DAC Network on Development Evaluation. And here's some of the key messages that we hope that you will get out of our presentations today. The first one is that, as many of you are likely aware, we, there are some deep governance and methodological challenges that affect evaluation of blended finance operations. In addition to these methodological and governance challenges, there are differences in the way that blended finance itself and related concepts are defined and used. And that makes it very difficult to learn across evaluations. So to share, for example, evaluation methods or evaluation approaches, and to use those across different institutions or different types of evaluations. It also means that it's difficult to learn across blended finance operations. Uh, that makes it harder for us to understand the evidence base about what works for whom and in what context. It is our hope and our belief that by understanding these differences and the implications they have for evaluation, this can actually help both evaluators, but also those working in strategic planning and management of blended finance operations to better navigate the approaches to blended finance and also to evaluating blended finance and ultimately to improve the contribution that blended finance is making to sustainable development, which is of course our shared goal. If I could have the next slide, please. We are focusing on blended finance because there is a lot of interest and appetite lately to hear about the role of different forms of finance for sustainable development. We know that in many countries, there is a lack of investment to support sustainable development goals and that there is a need to mobilize both public and private resources to align around the sustainable development goals and other environmental, social, and economic goals. But there's a real challenge around this disconnect that we see between the promise of blended finance and the hope that it will make a valuable contribution and what we actually see borne out in the evidence. Now, this is not only a lack of evidence, but the fact that some of the evidence we have based on evaluations of blended finance operations in the past is not entirely positive. And as I mentioned in the outset, evaluating blended finance poses particular challenges. And as you'll hear from our esteemed panelists, these challenges are not all entirely unique to blended finance, but many of them are quite acute in this field. And so we believe, and we think that probably most of you would agree, that we need not only more blended finance evaluation, also better evaluations of blended, blended finance. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, just to give you a bit of background from who we are and from what perspective we're speaking, this is a presentation by the Working Group on Evaluating Blended Finance of the OECD DAC, that's the Development Assistance Committee, Network on Development Evaluation. And this network, as we call it, EvalNet, is made up of the evaluation units of OECD member countries and multilateral development banks. And we work together to support and guide evaluations to improve evaluation capacity and develop standards. And we work across all different areas of evaluation of sustainable development, from peace building to gender equality and women's empowerment to blended finance. And the presentations today will be providing you with some initial insights. We are not presenting the official view of the OECD or the OECD DAC EvalNet either, um, or our institutions, but we're sharing with you some initial thinking from three pieces of work that are still ongoing that are focused on different aspects of the challenge of evaluating blended finance. And we hope to really help frame our discussion today and also to hear from you in the audience in ways that will help move forward our shared challenge around supporting learning and accountability to improve the contribution of blended finance to sustainable development. Next slide, please. Our first speaker is Ms. Ida Lindquist who is a senior advisor in the evaluation department in NORAD. She has extensive experience working on evaluations of a variety of development activities, 
and she is currently leading the work on understanding the ways of conceptualizing blended finance and how the differences in different terminology and definitions has implications for evaluation. She'll be sharing with us some initial insights on these evaluation challenges in this field. Thank you, Ida, and please go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Megan. Um, so uh, as part of, uh, of this work we're doing, um, we have commissioned uh, ADE and Just Economics to do a mapping of blended finance concepts and, uh, and also discuss consequences for evaluation. And the slides I'm going to show is based in a draft paper from, from that mapping exercise. And the most important um, thing to, to pay attention to in terms of uh, differences in use uh, relates to the concept of blended finance itself. Um, what we found when we looked at different definitions of blended finance were that they varied uh, a great deal along three different lines. Um, while most agree that when you're, um, when you're talking about blended finance, you're blending one type of finance with another in order to uh, move uh, towards the sustainable development goals, there was quite a large um, uh, disagreement in terms of how this was done. So one of the lines um, along uh, these uh, definitions uh, where they differed uh, depended on the source of funding for mobilization. So the figure you're seeing on the screen now is actually from an OECD paper from 2018, which can be uh, used to illustrate the differences in uh, blended uh, finance definitions. So uh, if you see the, the, the orange circle below, um, blended finance definitions uh, differ depending on whether uh, what is used to uh, mobilize funds includes development, public and private finance. It differs depending on what is mobilized, whether it's only uh, commercial uh, finance or whether it's market rate seeking both public and private uh, finance, uh, which could include development finance. And it differs depending on, uh, on whether blending needs to include concessional, finding, uh, concessional funding. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'm, I assume that uh, most of you are uh, very familiar with a generic theory of change. So you have some sort of problem, you have some sort of inputs, activities, outputs, and you get outcomes and you have an impact. Uh, and uh, the different theory of change will, depend, uh, will differ depending on the problem you're trying to solve. And what we found when we mapped the different blended finance concepts uh, were that not only did the def definitions of blended finance itself differ, but also the rationales, the problems they were trying to solve. And uh, when, while you might think that the differences uh, I pointed to earlier uh, are, we're basically figuratively speaking about different types of brands of cars, we're actually speaking about different types of motorized vehicles. So to give you an example, you can, you can have one type of blended finance concept or vehicle, if you will, where the main problem you're trying to address is a lack of uh, fi development finance. So development finance is very scarce and there's not enough to go around to reach uh, the sustainable development goals. So what we need to do, we need to mobilize commercial finance. So then you have a different type of vehicle, blended finance vehicle, where the main problem you're trying to solve is market failure, externalities, information asymmetry, and so on. And the input here wouldn't only be or just development finance, it would be concessional development finance, because you have a lot of projects that could move us towards the SDGs, but for some reason they're not bankable due to market failure, information asymmetry, and so on. So you can use concessional fin uh, finance to make it bankable and attract more market rate seeking finance. Uh, 
And what you see uh, if you compare these different types of blended finance concepts is that the input, if you're going to measure the input going into blended finance operations, uh, the size of this input will matter. For the first type of vehicle, we'll have all types of development finance will be counted as going into a blended finance operation, while for the second type of vehicle, only the concessional development finance would be uh, counted as input. While for uh, the first type of vehicle, only the commercial rates um, finance would be uh, considered as an output because this was a purpose, right? You had too little um, development finance to go around, so you need to attract more commercial finance. While for the other uh, type of blended finance operation where the problem uh, refers to, to, um, to um, externalities and so forth, what would be mobilized would be the unconcessional of funding, which could include development finance. Next slide, please. So the other really important uh, concept uh, where, there is, uh, where there is a difference that matters for evaluation uh, refers to different uses of the impact concept. And in the blended finance literature and world, um, I'm sorry, Ida, we seem to have lost your audio. I'm not sure if others can hear you as well, but let's just take a moment to hopefully you're, you're reconnecting. What we're looking at here, you'll see is the, on the right-hand side, the definition of impact as used by the OECD DAC Evaluation Network. And Ida has been exploring some of the different ways that impact is approached in the blended finance community. Ida, your video is frozen, perhaps try reconnecting. I'm sorry, we seem to have lost the connection with Ida. I do apologize for that. Let's go ahead and proceed then. Um, if we could go forward, we'll come back to finish the rest of Ida's presentation when she rejoins. Um, if we could have the next slide, please, then. Uh, Megan, I'm back, actually. Ah, here she is. Okay, just in time. Perfect. Could we go back one slide, okay. please? Go ahead, Ida. Thank you. So I apologize so much for that. Um, some issues with connections in Oslo, it seems. Uh, so, uh, so what what I uh, what I said or um, when in terms of impact, impact can be used as an evaluation criteria, or it can cover part of the evaluation criteria impact. And it, on this slide, you'll see I have uh, highlighted three words of the definition of impact uh, criterion um, in significant positive effects. Uh, sometimes impact in the blended finance literature simply refer to the effectiveness criteria or it could re uh, be used interchangeably with development additionality. Uh, then impact can also be used quite loosely and we see this a lot in discussions of blended finance that impact refers to the rationale for what we're doing or for what we're managing for or changes in indicators. Next slide please. So what are the uh, evaluation consequences of these differences in blended finance uh, definitions and in how the concept impact is utilized? Well, the first uh, really important um, implication to, uh, to pay heed to is that comparison and mapping will be very challenging. So um, if you're comparing very different blended finance operations, you're not comparing like with like. 
And if you want to map how much funding that's going into blended finance operations and how much funding that is mobilized, uh, it will differ a great deal uh, depending on what definition you have. So you have to be really careful when you're, when you're mapping and comparing. Uh, the second really important um, implication is that theory of change adaptation is very, very acute and, and necessary because these blended finance different uh, concepts, they are sort of, um, these operations will uh, be trying to deal with different types of problems. They, ha they may have very different theories of change and may rely on very different, for instance, uh, academic literature and so on and so forth. The third really important consequence uh, arises due to the uh, colloquial use of the word impact in, in these settings. And uh, I would say it's really highly important to pay attention to causality. If you're talking about impact as the change we want to achieve, and you say that impact is this and this, you have to make sure that you actually also know the causal effect of what, you, uh, what you're trying to achieve, because otherwise, uh, the changes you're, obs you're observing may have nothing to do with your blended finance operation. And finally, uh, one of the really essential uh, evasion consequences um, arises due to the partial usage of uh, the impact term where it doesn't cover the entire evaluation impact criteria. Um, evaluation criteria. Uh, that is that unintended uh, effects and higher level effects may not receive sufficient attention. So um, thank you for that and over to you, Megan. Excellent, thank you, Ida. And before we turn to our next panelist, I would just like to offer an opportunity for anyone in the audience, do you have any reflections on these evaluation consequences? And in particular, Ida has mentioned that perhaps evaluations run the risk of not paying sufficient attention to unintended or potentially negative impacts. And is this something that others have seen in, in your own work? Anyone can feel free to um, use the chat function or, or raise your hand if you're interested in coming in on that question or something maybe to keep in mind as we move on to our next panelist. So we're now turning to the next slide. Mr. Ole Winkler Anderson is a senior analyst at the Danish Institute for International Studies and he will be sharing with us the work on a second work stream related to evaluating blended finance, which focuses on additionality. And this is building on the earlier presentation from Ida, where we looked at the way different types, different definitions of blended finance and related concepts can have serious implications for evaluation. We'll now go much deeper, focusing on one key concept, which is the concept of additionality. Ola, please, over to you. Thanks a lot, Megan. Um, as you can see, I hope you can see, uh, the title of my presentation is Evaluating Financial and Development Additionality. And I'll divide my presentation into three parts. And I have only one slide for each part, so it's three uh, slides in total. And I'll be very brief and just try to introduce some topics, and I hope we can come back to some of them in the, in the discussion. I'm not going to any methodological uh, implications as at least some of them will be covered by Magdalena in the next presentation. In the first part, I will, um, and that's actually what you can see now on the slide, I'll give a brief background for my presentation. Megan has already provided some background for our work, but I'll give a bit more background for our motivation for uh, to work on additionality. In the second part, I will discuss some of the main issues and challenges related to evaluation of additionality. And then in the third part, I will just briefly summarize some observations and conclusions. This slide that's my, uh, is covering the first part. Uh, my pr uh, presentation is based on uh, joint work with colleagues from the University of Copenhagen. And, uh, and we have also prepared a draft working paper uh, for the Evernet working group mentioned by Megan in, the, in her introduction. And we hope that the paper will come out later this year, hopefully within the next couple of, of uh, months. As we have also heard from Megan, um, 
blended finance is increasing, the use of blended finance is increasing, and this reflects uh, difficulties in getting the SDGs uh, financed in developing countries, and an attempt, of course, to mobilize private development finance. And this um, increase has been followed by an increasing number of evaluations, as also mentioned by Megan. And we did a review uh, of some of these evaluations last year, uh, and the review was published as an OECD Development Corporation working paper. And I guess if you're interested in the paper, it should be very easy to find on the internet. As we have also heard, there's no agreement on, on how to define blended finance, but it's important uh, to note that blended finance uh, uses various uh, financial instruments and in various combinations. Blended finance therefore covers a number of modalities and instruments, and this has obvious implications for evaluation. Additionality is often referred to as the justification for blended finance operations. And additionality is part of the mandate for many multilateral organizations, for instance, the development banks. Uh, but also bilateral donors, including the NIDA, which I worked for for a number of years, often refer to their development assistance uh, as being additional. But in spite of this widespread reference to additionality, there's no general agreement on how to use the concept of additionality. OCD, uh, OCD has some agreed definitions for some types of additionality, but other definitions are also used. I will come back to that a bit later in my presentation. The absence of an agreement on how to define and use the concept of additionality has the implication that there's also no agreement on how to evaluate the additionality of blended finance. Therefore, there's still a lot of confusion and disagreement as we have also heard from, the, from Ida. And you should, could perhaps even argue that we, we do not even agree on what the disagreements are. A first step is therefore to understand the different positions, and we hope that our work can make a contribution to the needed clarification process. Just a few words about the method or the methods we used in our paper. Uh, um, as we always do in such studies, we have uh, reviewed evaluations and documents from uh, various international organizations. But in this case, we have also reviewed quite a lot, a lot of academic literature in order to see whether there was something to learn from that side. That's also something I will come back to. Next slide, please. I'll just briefly uh, touch upon uh, the three issues mentioned here. First, the term additionality. I believe most people would agree that additionality means that an intervention will lead to or has led to effects which would not have taken place without the intervention. And that it should be possible to establish a causal relationship between the intervention and the additional effects. But as soon as you start reviewing various analysis and also academic work, you realize that a number of types of additionality are mentioned. We did as part of our, um, our analysis or study, a quick search and found more than 700 academic papers which mentioned the term additionality in the title or in the, uh, or in the abstract. OECD has a great definition for financial additionality, value additionality and development additionality. While the multilateral development banks in their harmonized framework for additionality in private operations use only a distinction between financial and non-financial additionality. But a number of other types of additionality are mentioned in the literature. For instance, input, behavior, output, outcome, institutional, economic, and strategic additionality. These are not necessarily completely different types of additionality, but it's usually not made clear the degree to which they differ or are related. In our paper, we argue, and that's perhaps something we can come back to in the discussion, that the types of additionality often referred to in blended finance analysis should be analyzed within the broader concept of development additionality in order to maintain the overall objective of contributing to the SDGs in developing countries, as also mentioned by Megan in her introduction. 
but also when it comes to which dimensions uh, should be considered for each type of additionality, there are different perspectives. In the MDB's framework, a set of dimensions for financial and non-financial additionality is proposed, but our review, both of blended finance evaluations last year and the, academ uh, and the academic literature for this paper, did not find a uniform approach. And we only found very few attempts to relate the various dimensions uh, analytically. I mentioned in the beginning that blended finance covers a number of financial instruments. Our review of the academic literature clearly showed that assessment and evaluation methods will have to be designed in view of not only uh, the type, but also the, the, dimension, the dimensions of additionality, uh, but also the, the financial uh, or the applied financial instrument. And that's something I know that Magdalena will come back to in her presentation. Another unsettled issue is the relationship between additionality and standard evaluation criteria, as also alluded to by, um, by Ida. The MDP's uh, framework states that, and that's a quote, additionality is different from development impact. But the framework does not discuss whether and how additionality is related to the other evaluation criteria. And we will argue that in order to evaluate blended finance additionality, we need to clarify how additionality is related to standard evaluation criteria. And we, uh, in the paper, we, uh, we argue that uh, we did, and there we disagree with the MDPs, that there's a close relationship between development additionality and impact. That's perhaps also an issue we come back to in the discussion, and it was actually also, this discussion was also addressed by, by Eden. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, I'll just sum up on this. I'm partly repeating the main issues. Um, the first is that assessing additionality of blending of public and private finance is not new, it's not a new challenge. Our review document, documents that an academic literature uh, exists which can, con can contribute to the understanding and evaluation of additionality of blended finance although this literature uh, primarily focuses on developed economies. The second is that there's no agreement on types and dim dimensions of additionality, but we suggest to use financial and development additionality as main types of additionality. We also argue that each type of additionality may comprise a number of dimensions, which will require specific evaluation methods. The third conclusion is, and that's a direct con uh, consequence of the second conclusion, is that in evaluations, it must be made explicit which type and, and dimensions of additionality are addressed. And this will also include the potential relationship. And that again related to uh, the whole idea of using theory of change in your evaluations. And the fourth is that the relationship to evaluation criteria must be clarified in order to to uh, make evaluations of blended finance and also make them uh, comparisons uh, feasible. I think I'll stop here, and uh, but I would, of course, be happy to take questions. Thanks. Excellent, thank you, Ole. And we are very, you know, it's, it's very interesting to see some of the, these these key issues that are that are emerging quite clearly. And I took note of what you said of. There, there are a number of disagreements and sometimes we don't even agree on what the disagreements are. And so of course, it's even more challenging to, to try to find solutions. I think rather than opening it up, um, do feel free to use the chat function if you have a question or the, the Q&A function, which allows you to put questions to the panelists. Um, please go ahead and use that, start using that now if you'd like to. And uh, we will turn now to our last speaker. Next slide, please. Magdalena Orth is a senior evaluator and team leader at DEVAL, the German Institute for Development Evaluation. And building on the first two presentations, which explored some of the key conceptual issues, Magdalena will now provide a bit more technical look at the evaluation methodologies and share some insights from recent evaluation work, which explores the suitability of different methodologies for evaluating different blended finance instruments and mechanisms. I'll hand it over to Magdalena now, and please do feel free to start using the chat function to, uh, sorry, the Q&A function 
to uh, note down your questions for the discussion. Uh, Magdalena will take about 10 to 15 minutes and at uh, 45 past the hour, we'll start the question and answers. Go ahead, Magdalena, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the kind introduction, Megan. And yes, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from my side from Bonn, Germany today. Um, and yes, as already introduced, I will be talking um, as, as last in, in this row of panelists, I will be talking about specific evaluation methods for blended finance. Uh, so from time to time, this can get a bit more technical, but I will try to make it uh, both interesting to those uh, doing the evaluation evaluations themselves, but also to those uh, managing evaluations to, to have some takeaways for, for both groups. Um, so this work actually is also part, um, as introduced by Megan, of the um, work in the OECD DAC Evalnet Working Group on uh, Blended Finance Evaluation. And this third work stream is focusing on how to actually evaluate different blended finance instruments. Um, this is work in progress right now, but I will present first ideas and this is work being done in cooperation with Edward Jackson. Um, yes, next slide please. And to give you a first idea of uh, what we actually mean by different blended finance instruments that we that we keep talking about. So what is important in the blended finance space is that we cover a whole range of of both instruments but also mechanisms and for instruments just to name a few examples so we have equity instruments that are covered we have debt instruments first loss capital guarantees and then for mechanisms for example structured funds and syndicated loans so as you see we cover here a variety of, of different instruments that require specific evaluation methods so that is actually the first first lesson to to take away and I will get into more detail on this for this next slide, please. So um, what you heard already in the first two presentations, uh, first on conceptual differences and also on what Ole was talking about right now on uh, financial and development additionality, this all has implications uh, for both data collection and data analysis in the field of blended finance. Um, so regarding the implications for data collection, first of all, uh, we have common standards and guidance in, in this field that often offers help for both conducting evaluations and managing those evaluations. So just to name a few, and there are many more, we have, for example, from IFC, the operating principles for impact management with quite a lot of signatories that uh, confirm to, to offer annual statements. We have some guidelines for specific instruments, as I just mentioned on the slide before. For example, um, on climate bonds, there are standards and certification schemes that could be relied on for doing evaluations so in this case. And also we have some guidelines, for example, for calculating concessional price that was uh, um, published by the World Bank IFC and IMF a couple of years ago. But at the same time, as was mentioned by Ida, coming back to the theory of change, our challenge here is really that most impact management and measurement systems here focus on results indicators and in evaluation, in impact evaluation, we want to go a step further, focusing on impact in the sense of the DAC evaluation criteria on focusing on transformative change. And in the field of blended finance, what is particularly difficult here is that at the same time we have uh, issues around the confidentiality of information as we of course deal with the banking and investment sectors. So this impedes actually the access to data, but nevertheless it is necessary to, to focus on, on impact um, and to look here at social and uh, economic change that is taking place. And also, as mentioned by Ida, the key debates around blended finance and uh, the definition of blended finance, of course, inhibits common standards or make them much more difficult between the different actors. So next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So and then we have uh, some implications uh, for, for data analysis after covering the data collection side of things. Um, so as already mentioned, um, for impact, um, for looking at impact and evaluation, we have a theory of change as the basis for data collection and analysis. And to those of you, I spending more time in the field of evaluation methods. Um, there's one method discussed, um, the um, randomized control trials, or in short, RCTs, that are discussed as the gold standard. So first of all, I want to take a look at if this is actually appropriate um, for the evaluation of blended finance. And without going into any details here, so randomized control trials mean that you randomly um, distribute the intervention into a treatment and a control group and compare outcomes between those groups. And of course, this has a number of challenges and implications, but the most important one for blended finance is that it is most of the time not practical for blended finance interventions, as you have um, commercial interests in blended finance evaluations that actually makes it not really easy to randomly select who is treatment and who is control group. But we have actually a few instruments, for example, development impact bonds, which as an instrument themselves are are not aligned to commercial interest where this is possible and also it's a it's a timely and also expansive exercise so this is really appropriate for large-scale interventions or for interventions where you want to have a proof of concept so that it's actually makes sense to invest a lot of time in into such a method and last but not least, in terms of many blended finance instruments, this is difficult for complex causal change as you have, for example, in blended finance instruments that use intermediary structures. So meaning that the money is first of all go to a local intermediary and then to the end beneficiary, um, because this is not so much focusing on the mechanism as a method. So what this does this actually mean of what is appropriate to use. And with this, I will come to my last slide, please. So on the last slide, next slide, perfect, thank you. Um, you can see that um, we have different, as mentioned in the beginning, different instruments and mechanisms that require specific evaluation methods. And here we all often have the case that there's the need to integrate different methods to triangulate the findings and to overcome the limitations of individual methods I just mentioned for, for the first one for RCTs. Um, so to give you two specific examples here, um, we have first of all the contribution analysis. So this is a method that systematically examines the assumed causal relationship that is then based on the theory of change. This is often well suited for blended finance interventions that have complex causal change. So as mentioned, for all those instruments that cover intermediary structure before actually the money is provided to the end beneficiaries, such as is the case in structured funds, for example. And then we have the quasi-experimental designs at the same time, also a rigorous method in the try to, to evaluate impact, which compares outcomes in the treatment and control group, but not um, in a randomized way. So we are here using um, the, the method without the randomization. So this is often well suited um, or possible due to um, when randomization is not possible due to commercial considerations. And we have, um, it's also a time consuming exercise, but luckily we have at least some um, databases available, such as the mixed market one, which helps us to, to, to create control groups and thus, thus be less time consuming and less expensive in applying this method. So this was just to try to give you a very first idea on, on this highly technical issue. Um, of course, we are um, happy to answer any question, but I hope that this provides a little bit more background in, first of all, that specific uh, blended finance methods um, or specific evaluation methods are needed for different instruments and some first ideas of what you could combine in tackling impact measurement. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, Magdalena, and thank you, Ida and Ola, as well. I think those were three very clear presentations covering both the initial thinking around concept, 
how blended finance is conceptualized and some of the challenges that poses around the use of evaluation criteria, the use or the focus of different impact analysis and the attention to causality. And then finally, Magdalena's presentation here is the last one, really diving into the deeper details around some of the methodological approaches that have been used or tried and some of the pros and cons of those different approaches. I'd like to open it up now for a broader discussion. You'll see on your screen, there is a link to our webpage where you can find more information of our work and the three working papers. So each of the presentations that were just described are part of a ongoing work from the working group on evaluating blended finance of the OECD DAC Network on Development Evaluation. Each of those three work streams will culminate in the publication of a working paper and you can, we'll be able to download those on our website. They're not yet available, but they will be soon. And on that website, you can also find a link to a first working paper that outlines key governance challenges and, and issues as described by Ole in his presentation. So I'd like to open it up to the audience now. Please do use the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. And our first question, which I think I would put to Magdalena, but I'd also like to hear some thoughts from Ida and Ole. The first question is about how to handle this issue of not having a clearly articulated theory of change. Now, this is something we've heard um, in, in several different contexts, but I think in blended finance, it's quite clear that not only are theories of change often not very detailed or very well articulated, but you might have a variety of different theories of change, as you described, Ida. So how do you approach that, particularly in terms of data collection, Magdalena? What, how do you approach that challenge? Um, yes, perfect. Thank you so much. I think this is uh, really one of the, of the central questions uh, about evaluation methodology and how, how to deal with either not having a theory of change in place or having quite a generic theory of change. Um, so what we do in, in our evaluations of blended finance is um, as a first step to really, uh, first exercise in the evaluation to really reconstruct the theory of change and this could include different things i mean if there is no theory of change at all available you often have targets or aims of the interventions at least so in this case we would have uh, workshops as the very first thing of the evaluation together with stakeholders to draft uh, a theory of change that is then the basis for the further data analysis and data collection or sometimes you have uh, a little bit of a yeah, much more generic theory of change where you need to go into more detail to be actually able to use the theory of change for your evaluation. And in this case, it's uh, quite a similar approach that we use to also have a workshop with stakeholders to really uh, reconstruct their theory of change used for the intervention and to make it more specific in terms of um, what were actually the mechanisms you assumed were ta are taking place in order to receive the on the target. Um, so I can highly recommend um, such a workshop in the beginning with stakeholders because this also helps you to have a common understanding, first of all, about the blended finance definition, as was just mentioned by Ida, but also about the targets of the intervention that you need to have clear in order to come up in the end with an assessment of uh, successfulness um, and impact of this intervention. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Ida or Ola, would you like to come in on this question of how, how do you approach data and evaluation when you don't have a clear theory of change? Anything to mm -hmm. add? Yes. So thank you, Megan. I also really like that question. I don't think that's specific for blended finance. I think any evaluator almost approaching any uh, field will often be faced with this challenge that there is uh, the, the program theory might not be articulated. And uh, I completely agree with Magdalena that um, trying to tease out the uh, implicit program theory is really important when, when there isn't one uh, explicitly. What we also found in other evaluation is that you can try to use other academic literature or other evaluations to build a theory of change. Uh, and you can also compare this with the implicit program theory as a, a start for, for data collection. But it's a, it's a really important first step before you decide what data you need to collect. So, thanks. 
Paula, would you like to come in on this one? Uh, very briefly, I saw there was also a question on additionality. I know maybe I could also comment on on that question. Which, uh, yes, please. You can question. you can kick us off on that one as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe I don't have a lot to add to what Magdalena and Ida said, but the the main challenge is also if you look at it again from this perspective of additionality is to first to agree on, in a particular program, what sort of, what kinds of additionality, including what dimensions of additionality uh, uh, would you like to address? And that would also include the relationship between various dimensions of additionality, which should be, uh, let's say, captured in a, in, a, uh, in a certain theory of change. And if that's not, if you haven't, if you're not able to do that, it would be very difficult to actually conduct the evaluation. That would be my. The other, I think, the other question, as it was a little, it was a bit long, maybe, but I think it's a very good question uh, on on um, additionality and commercial interest in this area. Um, what is a key challenge is that there are many different actors in this field. You have, we have banks development banks, but you also have, for instance, bilateral donors. And I think it's clear from following this discussion over the last couple of years, or maybe a little bit longer, that there are different perspectives and interests. And the, the chance is how to reconcile these different interests or agree on what's uh, the, or the rationale for having uh, various perspectives. So that's one issue. And uh, we, in our paper, we will, uh, uh, take uh, our point of departure is in OCD's definition, where blended finance as seen, is seen as a way to mobilize private funds for uh, financing the SDGs. So we have, and uh, our perspective is sustainable development of financing the SDGs in developing countries. But other may have another perspective, and if you have a more narrow perspective, for instance, a more commercial perspective. You may not, in the same or to the same extent, actually, Ida also mentioned that capture uh, unintended effects, uh, higher level effects, uh, externalities, etc., uh, etc. Et so, our perspective abroad, we try to sort of to cover a broader set of effects than maybe, I don't know how many are listening from some of the development banks, but. I would still argue that the development banks usually do. So there are different perspectives here which directly influence how we go about the uh, evaluations of the uh, plan of finance. But I think it's a key question raised by uh, the participants. So. Yes, so this uh, excellent. Thank you, Ola, and thank you for that question, Binad. I think that there's also important to keep in mind this spectrum of avoid the difference between businesses or investors avoiding negative social and environmental impacts for which they may do including some ex ante type of assessments and the difference between actually trying to make a positive proactive contribution to sustainable development which requires tools and methods that are much more advanced in, in terms of looking at the potential implications and other effects including potentially negative effects and weighing those up and valuing them through evaluative analysis uh, Magdalena or Ida, would you like to come in on this question around, you know, are there experiences in conducting evaluation of blended finance with investors or businesses and any insights on how they approach additionality? And I think particularly the, the question is around what, what experiences are currently available from the field more broadly. Anything you'd like to add there? Yes, thank you, Megan. I, I really like this question. So. Uh, I think there is a lot to to learn from. Uh, as uh, as Megan said, you can you can look at ex ante on on doing no harm, but you also have many actors like the IFC. They have performance standards, so you can you can evaluate whether um, whether a project, a blended finance project, is actually reaching its intended goal. But you could also evaluate the steps they're taking to prevent doing harm across their process and the extent to which, for instance, they're following the performance standards of the IFC or of some other organization. 
So um, yeah, I, I think there's, uh, there's plenty of, of, uh, of opportunities for taking a broader look. Um, but as um, the first question sort of highlighted, you need to have an, an understanding of the mechanisms and the program theory in order to do that. Um, yes, I would uh, also like to to add to what uh, Ole and Ida were just saying, um, because there was uh, specifically the question about experience of conducting evaluations. So I wanted to share experience with an evaluation uh, that we recently conducted in the field of blended finance. Um, so an evaluation where we are talking about uh, one mechanism just introduced structured funds. Um, so structured funds is quite a complicated financial structure. I won't go into any details there, but the important thing is that the money from the fund is provided to local financial intermediaries. So for example, microfinance banks or local commercial banks, um, and then they on lend the money then to the end beneficiaries. And of course, in, in the end, in looking at um, positive or negative effects, unintended, intended effects, you are actually interested or your donors are interested to know what is actually happening on level of the end beneficiaries. But still it's important then to understand that using this instrument, you are going via the intermediaries. And for example, in terms of unintended effects or negative effects, we were for example, looking at processes of how those uh, local intermediaries actually on land. So for example, what kind of consumer protection principles do they have in place? For example, of um, what is the financial literacy? How do they address this? So this is then something you can, uh, can even check at level then off, uh, off the private side or the investors um, to make sure that you do not have any negative effects in, on level of the end beneficiaries. So this just as, as one example from a recently conducted evaluation. Excellent. Uh, thank you all for those inputs and I hope that helps address uh, Binan's question. Uh, do feel free to use the Q&A function to share other questions or also your own insights or thoughts. In the meantime, I'd like to come back to this issue that Ola raised around the evaluation criteria. And as I, I believe some of you are aware, we've gone through a rather lengthy process of revisiting the definitions of the evaluation criteria originally set out by the OECD DAC in 1991. And it was quite interesting during those discussions to see how the issue of additionality was actually raised. And I think we saw a whole spectrum of different perspectives. Um, from the perspective that additionality should be treated as its own standalone criteria, either in terms of financial additionality of the inputs or outputs, but also in terms of non-financial additionality, development additionality, or other types of additionality. And, and then we also heard spectrum, on the other end of the spectrum, the idea that additionality is actually an underlying concept that applies not only to blended finance, but to other forms of public finance, for example, that's for finance to be additional uh, is, a, is a key underlying principle that we can't really even start looking at impacts until we've looked at whether the money is new or additional to what would have happened otherwise. And that that's an underlying concept um, across evaluation, even in the public sector and international development. Um, just to take one live example, we see lots of questions now about the response to COVID-19 pandemic and the extent to which support that's being provided to help the response in developing countries, is it additional to what would have been provided otherwise? And so uh, along this spectrum, we also saw some arguments that additionality should be addressed under the criteria of relevance or under the criteria of effectiveness. And so I'd be interested to hear from the panelists on your own thoughts of how the additionality is addressed in relation to these evaluation criteria. Um, do, do we need to incorporate it? Do we need to ignore it or does it depend as is the case for most evaluations? And also from, from the participants, the attendees, feel free to use the chat function or the Q&A to share your own perspective on how you can use additionality in relation to the evaluation criteria. Maybe Ola, I'll go to you first to hear some of, I tried to outline what I've seen as, as the perspectives, but you might have a different perspective on where the, where the debate and discussion lies. Yeah, um, this is a very 
I see maybe the easy answer. That's a very complex discussion. Um, uh, but I think this is an area where we still, I'm not sure we agree on where we disagree. And, and when I read uh, the MDB's framework, I, which I referred to in my presentation, and, and it states that additionality is different from development impact, then uh, I'm still a little bit puzzled with what, what is the implication of that. If additionality is, is something separate, distinct from the evaluation criteria, what is the implication of that? Is it, uh, or what, what sort of implications will it have when we try to use our evaluation criteria to evaluate blended finance? Or should we have another or uh, additional criteria when we try to assess additionality? I think that's, uh, that's a key issue, and that's a discussion I think we'll have to have also in the future. So we try to reach an agreement on this. I think in the paper, with, but it's still the draft version we have, um, our argument is uh, that, the, that the various forms or kinds of additionality are related. That would also imply that uh, some sort of additionality would be more closely related to some of the evaluation criteria, while other, for instance, development additionality may be closer to what we usually understand as impact within the evaluation community. Um, we have not really discussed what, um, I think Ida briefly mentioned it, but there's a whole discussion about the relationship between uh, additionality and causality. And causality is also an integrated part of how we use the um, uh, evaluation criteria. But, so that's also an area where we have to have more discussions on this. Is there a close relationship? I think I also indicated in my presentation. And if there is, how, how should we sort of assess that relationship or even make it more operational and more specific? So I see a lot of links between the criteria and the additionality, but we have to work at the sort of the, our understanding out in more uh, detail. So yeah, I will stop there. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Ida, would you like to come in a bit more on this issue around causality and uh, do we equate causality with additionality or how do we approach this question? We also have a question on the floor, which I think is very related from Ellen Pena at UNICEF, asking if we know of any tools or measures around the impact of blended finance in terms of additionality that, that already exists. So please feel free to share those if you, if you do have some examples. Go ahead, Ida. Thank you so much, Megan. I'm uh, I'm actually really pleased with this discussion of additionality in blended finance because one way of interpreting this uh, definition would be that um, that we're actually talking about causality, right? As as Ola said, so a lot of people who are talking about development additionality or uh, financial additionality or va value additionality are often talking about additional, it's something um, that there is a causal effect on something uh, on development or on values or on uh, finance uh, and, and we're really interested in whether what we're doing actually is causing this or whether it, we're just observing a, a change in, in, um, in outcomes or in indicators. Uh, and uh, as I said, the, a, a danger of the way that impact is used loosely is that we lose out of this discussion of causality. So in that sense, I think it's really welcome that there is so much emphasis on additionality in the blended finance uh, world. Um, and um, my only sort of um, my only concern with this focus on additionality or using the word additionality rather than causality is that uh, additionality is often defined as counterfactual causality. So something um, uh, something is happening that wouldn't otherwise have happened. Uh, while you also have a more mechani mechanistic view of, of causality, which we might lose sight of if we're focusing on counterfactual causality, if, if, if additionality is getting so much, uh, so much focus. So uh, that would mean that we are focusing more on proving a causal, uh, that something happens because and not why, 
I think that that could be a risk of uh, of talking about auditionality all the time rather than using the, the word causality, if you mean causality when you're talking about additionality. And then for the question from, from Alan, uh, if additionality means counterfactual causality, then there's lots of really nice evaluation methods which can be used to assess uh, the additionality of blended finance operations, because then you can just go to the, all the, the, the methods that, that are trying to assess causality, either using small N methods or large N methods, where you would have the uh, quasi experiments or the uh, RCTs, or if you have for the small N methods, where you look at sort of, the, you have other types of, of methods. So I, I think that's that's all for now. But I'm really eager to hear from the audience uh, if you agree that uh, additionality often just means counterfactual causality, or if you have a different understanding of additionality in blended finance. Great. So that's a question to you all then in the audience. Uh, do you agree, and do you think that? in the way you've heard the term additionality used in your own institutions or in evaluations you've carried out, are people implying that this is a causal relationship to either the additional finance or the additional development results? Or is it a different, a different issue? What are, what are your perspectives? We'd love to hear from you. You can use the chat box or the Q&A function. One question I'd like to bring, uh, going a bit deeper into this issue of how we approach additionality is also the application of the criteria of efficiency. I haven't heard any of you mention the term efficiency, but efficiency is of course looking at the extent to which the resources that are used are used economically in order to achieve the results and the conversion of inputs to outputs, outcomes, and impacts. So when we're talking about blended finance and additional finance to, from either the private sector or, or others, what, how do we look at efficiency? And where do you see the application of the criteria of efficiency? Is that something that you've looked at? Uh, maybe Ola, I can turn to you or Magdalena, you might have some experience from your recent evaluation work. Go ahead. Um, yes, um, I, I'm not sure I have so much to add to, the, to this discussion, so I'll ask you to pass it on to Magdalena, thanks. Thank you, Ulle. Um, yes, I think um, efficiency or the criterion efficiency is, is very good that we're talking about because at least my experience with many evaluations is that we are quite strong on, on the side of, of focusing on relevance and on effectiveness and on impacts, but often efficiency in the sense of really giving an assessment of cost benefit is really often not, not so much taking place. And I think what is important in, in blended finance is uh, once again that it depends a lot on the intervention of what you actually need to compare in looking at blended finance and to give one example um, that I that I already mentioned for example for us it was um, on how to evaluate efficiency in structured funds was really the question of what is the alternative that the owners are using if they would not rely on blended finance here and as i mentioned it's in the end it's microfinance going to end beneficiaries via an intermediary structure so what we actually did in um, assessing efficiency was to compare to direct credit lines um, going to end beneficiaries in this case to assess what kind of cost and what in what kind of um, situations and mechanisms do we apply actually credit lines going to end beneficiaries um, and compare this to the intermediary structure so for example stating in how far in how far do we need this complex fund structure which of course has transaction costs and in what situations is actually the fund being able to provide money that a direct credit line wouldn't be able so for example for very small credit sizes this is actually the case for very small programs where um, normally DFI wouldn't invest. Um, so this is actually what we were comparing to. And I think this is important that this depends a lot, of course, on the intervention, but that the question really is to, to what are you actually comparing to to answer then efficiency. But I think this is 
very important that we focus more on efficiency in, in our evaluation specifically as the justification of blended finance is, is of course that we that we need uh, the, the, the public sector to come into a sphere where we would normally expect uh, the private side to invest. So I think efficiency is central, very central here. So this just as a few thoughts. Excellent. Thank you, Magdalena, for those those insights around efficiency and, and what is the alternative use of funding, which is, of course, a critical, critical dimension, given the, the funding gaps that we see in most countries related to the sustainable development goals. Um, do we have other questions? I don't see any other questions from the audience. Um, so maybe I would like to to come back to Magdalena just quickly on because you've been working on several evaluations lately, it'd be interesting to hear a bit about how the how has been the, re the reaction to or the reception of these evaluations in in the blended finance field. So in your colleagues that are working on st at the strategic or the managerial level in blended finance operations, uh, is there an openness to evaluation? Is there uh, a fear of evaluations, as we sometimes find <laughs> in, in when we try to work with our colleagues in different parts of the government. Um, what, what has been your experience of how those working in blended finance, how do they relate to evaluations and to the work you've been doing? Um, yes, thank you so much, Megan. I think that's a that's a very good and, and interesting question. Um, I think because we we are dealing specifically, and I think you mentioned this in the introduction as well for blended finance, which is fear, which is really getting a lot of attention um, in the last years. And I think a lot of promises are also connected to blended finance. This is not only um, in terms of mobilizing more capital, but also in, in terms of development effect of blended finance. And at least so far in, in the evaluation space, we do not have uh, so many evaluations in place. So I would say that in, in general, we have a lot of interest in these evaluations. And what I can say from discussions uh, at different fora and, and working groups, what I think is really great to see um, that a lot of interest also really focusing on what are impacts on level of the end beneficiaries, so the so-called downstream effects. And I think this is really important to cover in blended finance, because the aim, in my perspective, at least is in the end not to mobilize capital but to mobilize capital to uh, invest this uh, mobilized capital to the SDGs and to effects on level of the end beneficiaries and so I was really happy to see that we have this interest in in those downstream effects of course at the same time we have the problem that this is the most difficult to evaluate so here we are talking and really about the impact evaluations that are um, well, that need resources in terms of time. Um, um, but this is really one thing that I liked. And as was mentioned in one of the last comments, we also see that, yes, we have from the different, um, different partners involved, really a lot of interest also coming from the private side, from the side of the fund managers, a lot to, to be interested in the social and economic and environmental effects. So um, there is actually the interest. What I think is really a bit the issue is still of, um, first of all, the problem in definitions that we still need to tackle or that we need to have at the beginning of an evaluation, at least some form of uh, shared opinion of what blended finance is in this case. Um, and then also, of course, the issue of how much time and money is needed for such evaluations. And so I I think what we also um, promote in this case is that, of course, you cannot have a full-fledged impact evaluations for all those blended finance interventions, but that it's really important to have at least those of strategic importance or proof of concept where it's then really, really important to have an impact evaluation stating some evidence and providing evidence. Thank you. That's excellent. And, and Magdalena, when you mentioned trying to get down to the beneficiary level and to really get deeper into understanding the effects on, on people and communities, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the work on the impact checklist that you've done with the Tree Hatakana uh, impact group. And then for those of you that are not aware, this is a, 
a declaration about blended finance and trying to improve blended finance. It's an international collaboration led by Indonesia amongst other partners. Um, but through that work, Magdalena and others have been working on developing a tool. And it's, a, as I believe, a checklist related to understanding impact. Could you just tell us a bit about that? And I've, I've put a link in the, in the chat box. Yes, perfect. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, this is very nice that you mentioned yeah, that you mentioned the checklist. So yes, um, so we have for the Tree Takarana roadmap on blended finance. This is actually a multi-donor platform um, dealing with blended finance and how to address issues in in blended finance. We have also an impact working group, and this is co-chaired by um, Nancy Lee from the Center for Global Development and. Um, myself um, and we were working on on a checklist to actually assess uh, the the impact of blended finance interventions on the poor because uh, what we see in the blended finance space is of course that a lot of actors um, focus on on their impact on the poor or want to have a contribution on the SDGs but often we have um, frameworks um, on results measurement and management in place that are actually not touching upon or specifically touching upon this level. So what we try to do is to come up with a, a very comprehensive checklist. So in order to really cover uh, a lot of different kinds of investments, of blended finance investments to help as a generic tool of what you actually need to check First of all, ex ante, but also then specifically exposed to be looking at benefits as well as risks. And this is, uh, as, uh, as Megan mentioned, and also pasted the link, uh, this is public. So this would be one tool um, that you could, could address uh, when you want to check for certain indicators in what, what to look at on, as impact on the poor of blended finance. Excellent, thank you. And, you know, we've been focusing here on blended finance, but it's interesting to see, you know, how much of these challenges that we're hearing about is really something very unique to blended finance. And to what extent can we actually draw on learning from evaluation in other areas of development? Um, so I'd like to maybe hear a bit more from Ida about this question. And also if anyone in the audience has ideas about how we can actually support cross-learning to really help leapfrog blended finance, um, even though we know blended finance itself is not new, and assessment and evaluation work of blended finance or similar types of approaches is, is also not new, but uh, perhaps there's a scope for some more learning from, from other areas of development that are perhaps a little bit further along. Ida, could you share some thoughts with us? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Megan. So I, I guess what's really, um, there's a lot of things that are special with blended finance. And one of the things that, that is special is that there is a meeting of new actors, right? The purpose of blending is to attract types of finance that perhaps wouldn't otherwise have uh, gone for the SDGs or sort of poured to, towards funding the SDGs. So what's special uh, with blended finance compared to other, compared to other development areas or other areas where we're trying to promote the SDGs is that you have all these new actors. So then it's perhaps not so surprising that we're talking about development additionality and financial additionality, that we have all these different usages of the word impact and so on and so forth. And I listened to a really interesting uh, presentation at the EES two years ago, I think it was in Greece where um, the, an evaluator within the blended finance field said it's everything is so difficult to evaluate in blended finance because we have uh, we have a commercial interest we have a, it's so difficult to 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 draw the scope it's so difficult to measure and so on and my impression when i was sitting there listening to this hey hey we have all these uh, these challenges also for traditional evaluations within the development field so i think what's really important to pay attention to is to take note that there is specific jargon in the blended finance world. There is uh, different uses of concepts such as impact. There is all this focus and discussion of additionality. But when it comes to methods for assessing causality, 
uh, methods for, for dealing with many of these problems where you sort of have, uh, where your part of the project is, is funding a little bit while commercial interests maybe are funding much more, then there is a lot of experience within more traditional evaluations within the, uh, the de development field, which I think can be really valuable to, uh, to uh, evaluators in the blended finance where as long as they're aware of these conceptual differences because then they can just dive into this literature and look for for methods that can be helpful that's excellent and i think a, a voice of hope that all is all is not dark and gloomy and confused but actually a lot of these challenges have been confronted and overcome uh, within other parts of, of development and, in, and within individual institutions as well. I see we have a number of colleagues uh, participating. Zahra Rabai from the Islamic Development Bank. I see we have Irene Ban from the Asian Infrastructure Bank. Uh, just curious if any of you might um, also want to share experiences or approaches from within your, your own institutions. Do feel free to to put those comments into the Q&A as well. Uh, we would be interested to hear, you know, do you, do you have a similar impression that you've been able to draw from other areas in order to learn about how best to approach evaluation of blended finance? Or do you find that you're uh, still struggling with, with this issue as, as many of our institutions are? We'd, we'd love to hear from you. And also the Q&A function, it's at the bottom of your screen, can be used to ask any other questions. Um, maybe just to come back then to, to Ola, and if you could tell us a bit more about the research you've been doing into additionality. Um, maybe for the lay person, you know, when we hear financial, non-financial additionality and development additionality, this, it, it, it's often unclear what, what are the basic differences here. And, and why do they really matter for an evaluator from the evaluation perspective? Yes, um, thanks, Megan. Um, just before I comment on this, I just make a few comments to the discussion so far, and also what Ida said. I think there's, for me, there's no direct link or understanding of relationship between additionality or counterfactual causality. Uh, I don't think that, but that's something to be discussed, but I don't see that one type of causality is, is more closely uh, related to additionality than other, let's call it understanding of causality. Uh, but uh, something to develop, and this discussion has not been, as far as I know, taken so far. Um, on, on, on the experiences, um, both when we did the review uh, last year, and Magdalena was also part of that, and also the literature review we did for this paper. Uh, almost all uh, assessments or evaluations we found in, in the academic world, they were based on, let's call it very, very quantitative or in many cases, uh, uh, analysis based on counterfactual thinking. So there's, we found very little uh, which used other approaches, or other perspectives on causality. But that's maybe also something Magdalena could come in on because you have done a little to review also now. Um, I, I, I think it, the, the importance of be clear on how we understand the different types of additionality has direct implications for the selection or design of evaluations. Uh, um, and um, if, for instance, you, you think, let's take one concept, value additionality. Is it related to uh, development outcomes or uh, development additionality in some way or another? Is it only focused on an e ESG instance? That will also have uh, huge implications for how you design your ev evaluation if you have a more narrow scope or a broader scope or broader understanding of, of the individual types of additionality. And that's why what I tried to say in my presentation is that the first step is, of course, to be clear on or clarify how we understand and define the various types of additionality. But also, when you do an evaluation, be very explicit on which types of ad and dimensions of uh, additionality you intend to cover. If you don't do that, we will never be able to compare or learn from the evaluations. 
so even you, if you disagree on how broad the scope should be, you should at least be able to agree on how you sort of what the breadth or uh, how broad you make uh, the scope of the evaluation you are undertaking. But we are still not there. I agree, but that's that's at least must be a first step. And that would also reflect the different perspectives and interest in these evaluations. Uh, I think I will stop there. Excellent, thank you, Ola. And we have just a few more minutes left. So I'd like to go to uh, Magdalena and Ida, if, you, if you'd each like to come in and feel free to share any, any final thoughts or reflections for the group as, as we wrap up our session. Thank you, go ahead, Magdalena. Yes, thank you. I uh, actually have, have a number uh, of thoughts um, and one reaction to, to what Ole just mentioned, because um, I think that was a, was a very good point, um, Ole, that you were referring to what we actually found in the literature review. And as Ole mentioned, um, I think two years ago, we focused on what uh, do we have in terms of evaluations in the blended finance space and in terms of um, it's, it's right, I, I agree with the older that we really had in terms of causality, we had counterfactual causality addressed, but in terms of evaluation methodology, I think it was very interesting to see that overall in, in those evaluations that they basically um, covered um, before and after comparisons. And I think this is uh, also quite important in talking about causality that in the end by, by just a simple before and after comparison, we're not, not not really able able to answer this so I think this is really a field of um, actually also one of the reasons why we focus on, on this part in, in our working group is uh, to uh, to really approach with the blended finance methodology and to your question Megan of why does an evaluator need to be interested in the concept of additionality I think for me this is one of the most central points of blended finance and as mentioned earlier for me additionality is really the justification of using blended finance because um, for me this is not really an, a name in itself uh, to use it but really only have, if we have additionality it makes sense to use it and so I think for an evaluator this should be a central thing to, to discuss in evaluations. Um, and also, as, uh, as mentioned by Ole, it's very important then to, to differentiate between um, financial and development additionality, because I think what we have in the discussion around blended finance is a lot of times we focus on, on the financing gap, on how much money do we actually need to address the SDGs and how much money do we still, do we still lack. Uh, so a lot is about the financing gap. And of course, I agree that it's important that with blended finance, we, we are able to mobilize uh, additional capital. But I think this, once again, is not a means in itself. But in the end, this is only um, that we want to mobilize capital to achieve certain outcomes and I think this is then really the differentiation between financial and development additionality and why we need both to focus on first of all um, financial wise what, did, what were we able to achieve but also in terms of effects to really focus on on the developmental additionality on this side and maybe this as my as my concluding thoughts on this topic. Thank you so much Magdalena. Ida. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. Well, I think the the most important sort of message coming out from from uh, from these from Workstream One at least is uh, that anyone who's interested in evaluating blended finance have to pay attention to what type of blended finance operation are they actually evaluating, and uh, and, and and to to build uh, a theory of change for the evaluation or to uh, make the program theory uh, explicit. And this theory of change can be used to develop some hypothesis about potential negative and adverse effects, which can be tested uh, in, uh, through, through the evaluation. So think carefully about adverse effects, long, longer term effects and higher level effects since these types of uh, um, uh, issues don't always get the attention they deserve. Uh, and then I would really uh, think a lot about the mechanism that's 
um, believed to be in play and what relevant literature that's out there. Because sometimes even if it's difficult to use an RCT or it's difficult to prove something causally, you can use existing literature uh, or uh, theory, economic theory to discuss financial additionality and, and development additionality if these more sort of advanced methods are, are difficult to, to employ. So thank you, Megan. Excellent. Thank you, Ida, for those, those closing thoughts. And I see also Carrie Korhonen from the European Stability Mechanism has provided a really interesting example of a quite complex evaluation that was done around the crisis assistance to Greece. And the link is available now in the Q&A section. So you're welcome to, to capture that. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Carrie. And I've also shared a link to our OECD website where you can find more information on this working group on the evaluating blended finance. And we will also be publishing the three working papers that will cover each of our three panelists uh, insights and some insights from the partners that we've been working with. And those will be available uh, in the next month or so for the first paper and then uh, coming over the next couple of months for all three working papers. I've also pasted a link to Derek, the DAC Evaluation Resource Center, where you will find evaluations of private sector development, also PPPs, public-private partnerships, and some blended finance related evaluations, including uh, the recent review by IF, of IFC blended finance operations that was conducted by the Independent Evaluation Group of the World Bank. So a lot more resources out there. I think we've heard from the panelists a bit about the complexity and the challenges related to the concepts underpinning blended finance and how that makes the job of us evaluators quite difficult. But we've also heard some, I think, quite positive insights on how we can learn from other areas of development evaluation and how we can draw on the full toolbox of evaluation to really try to shed more light on the realities of blended finance, on, on who is benefiting from blended finance, in what ways, and are our investments in blended finance in fact worth it at the end of the day in terms of understanding the, the alternative uses of public funds and also the, the development benefits. So we'll go ahead and close it there for today. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to participate, uh, taking time out of your morning or your evening, and look forward to seeing you the rest of this week. Also, just to take a moment to thank our hosts from the Asian, Evalu uh, Asian Development Bank. We really appreciate the very smooth uh, technical support and all of the pre preparatory work that's gone into uh, these events. So thank you so much, and thanks to all of you. And thanks also to our panelists for your input. Have a nice day. Thank you.